welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chorus American Academy a tennis webinar on this fantastic Saturday evening. Uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Randy Stevenson, the head of Corvus American Academy, and I'm coming to you from uh, Bandra, Mumbai. So without further ado, we're joined tonight by uh, two pros in the tennis world uh, with athlete development, working with youngsters and college uh, kids, as well as uh, professionals throughout their career, as well as also having uh, astounding careers themselves. So our sports partner and our you know, curriculum curator for tennis is Coach Scott Mitchell. Uh, Mr. Mitchell comes to us tonight from Florida with Premier Tennis Academy. Hey, Scott, it's really good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You know, I've, I've, I grew up in a sports uh, family. Uh, we're around some of the biggest and best coaches in, in all sorts of sport, sports, from, you know, football to uh, American football to soccer to uh, tennis and basketball and, and um, really took a lot from all the different coaches as I grew up and um, was a pretty accomplished junior player, ended up playing at Indiana University. Um, and then once I left there, um, I went on to um, – uh, to Dennis Vandermeer. Um, been involved in coaching for many years, and Ryan, uh, who you'll hear from here in a minute, has been with us off and on for, um, geez, probably 20, 25 years. And, um, and so we've started off with camps and academies, and they've been super successful. Um, now, I think everybody realizes that, you know, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, the way we coach our juniors is, is different than we used to. Um, you know, it's not so much about understanding the technical aspects before we understand the tactical. You know, uh, w once they understand what they want to do with the ball, we'll kind of go through the process and the progressions of showing them how to do it. Um, so our, our program is, is very unique as it's, it's very child centered. It's, you know, we're, we're not you know, I trained at Balateri's for a little while and, and some of these other places, and, and they're very cookie cutter. They're, you know, the, a lot of the, the development is, is based around one philosophy as opposed to um, what we do is we take every, every child, every player, and we individualize their curriculum and their training based on uh, a lot of different, you know, their, their play style, but also their um, physical ability. You know, if they're six feet six, if, as opposed to somebody my size, um, you know, maybe I'm not going to be somebody who's going to be coming to the net, but somebody 6'4", six, 6'6", six, six might be coming in a little bit more often. Their serves are going to be a big weapon. So we, we really customize our training for each individual child, which is big. With Ryan on board, we've, we've uh, implemented our program in a lot of different facilities around the U.S., and Ryan's left and gone on to sport time and some other places and, and taken elements of what we do and we've taken elements of what he does. And really, I believe we've put together a, a great program uh, and curriculum that you're probably not gonna find at any other uh, academy around the country, um, as well as the US. So um, I think we have a great partnership with Corvus and I'm excited to get things going. One of the things that we've done in our sport for hundreds of years is we've coached boys and girls from the technical and the tactical elements the same and we know physically they're not so for instance grips for years we used to teach the same grips to boys and girls where over time we know that that's actually not not um, the direction we should be taking the kids and and what I always tell people is if you look at um, you just take and you don't have to take my word for it you can do research you can go online and look at uh, you know a photo of um, or a video of somebody like Serena Williams, where you look at the grips and the, the, the spacing of the arms as opposed to somebody like a, uh, an Andy Murray and notice his grips and his, his straightening of the arms. And so there's different things that we've coached the kids and I wanna make sure that these are the elements that we're implementing with the kids there. Um, and so that, that, because those are the, as they start to play, those are the things that are gonna break down. And if yeah. we haven't, if we haven't really focused on the foundation and the core element of it, uh, they're going to struggle as they get bigger and better uh, with different things. People are going to attack certain areas that we've got to make sure are strong. So I think um, there's not a ton that I think that we can't fix. They're just little things, but those little things turn into giant things as they get bigger. Hi, good, good evening, everybody. A pleasure to be here. Hope you're all doing well today. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. I grew up uh, in Johannesburg, 
I was in the top 50 as a kid. All the guys that Scott mentioned earlier, I grew up playing with. Um, they all moved on to, um, to, uh, to Vandermeer down in South Carolina. And I decided to take a different route. Um, I initially came over to the States to play collegiate tennis at uh, Georgia Tech. I found out that the fit wasn't for me. I moved on to Israel and I played for some professional tennis in uh, the Middle East and Europe. And then I decided I really wanted to come back and play collegiate tennis. And that was my goal. From as, all, as far as back as I can remember, that was my goal to play collegiate tennis. So I came back over and I found a nice fit and, and I enjoyed it. I moved on from uh, collegiate uh, as a player to as a head coach down in Georgia uh, in the small school, um, which was a great school for me to, to wet my feet as the head coach for you know, NCAAs. And then from there, you know, I moved on and uh, I've been at uh, John McMurray Tennis Academy. I'm also here now the director at Barney Bar Country Club in uh, New York. And the great thing about it is what Scott mentioned is, um, you know, the, the technical aspect directly influences the tactical. And we've been working very hard on, you know, seeing the differences between the, the growing athlete, the student athlete, and, and knowing that the, the girls and boys actually react differently on the court. They respond differently to the coaching methods that we have. And it is my role to actually, you know, monitor each child as they are growing and developing and make sure that they're the best athlete on and off the court. I'm hands-on. I'll be on the court, um, you know, every single day. I'll be monitoring uh, the kids, getting to know the kids personally, um, working with them with some goal setting, you know, the short-term, intermediate and long-term goals, looking at uh, what we need to do and improve the technically, tactically, physically and emotionally on the court and see, you know, day-to-day -day what we need to do. And having that dialogue, not only with the kids on the day-to-day -day basis, but then being open to the parents calling me and emailing me and letting me know, you know, what, what they think, what their feedback is. Um, I'm always willing and open to, to conversation. And the great thing about being on the ground is that I can actually get to know these kids and become, you know, not only their tennis coach, but also their mentor, not only on the tennis court, but off. Our goal setting is very, uh, very um, detailed, right? So we want to have some mental and physical skill goals that we set in place. Um, you know, how, how the kids handle certain situations, um, if there's certain situations that they're not doing well, um, you know, visual, um, visual learning and all that kind of stuff needs to be part of the goal setting. So if they're not exposed to that yet, we want them to uh, eventually get exposed to that. They'll get that obviously during our program. Um, we set very specific but measurable goals. So uh, we want to make sure that um, when we set the goals that they're, they're difficult, but they're realistic and they're very specific. So um, it's, it's not a, something, well, you know, the child is going to say, you know, I want to win, I want to win a tournament or I want to, I want to, you know, win three tournaments this year or whatever. We want very specific measurable goals. And as we go through them, we're going to set timelines to those. So if it's a, trying to achieve a certain ranking or be inside a top 50 or 100 or 25, we start setting uh, dates to those completions. If, if, you're, if your child's ranked 100 and we want them to jump quite a big, you know, it's a big jump, maybe from 100 to 25, um, that may be a year-end goal. So we start to set short-term, intermediate, and long-term goals to all of these. And, and Ryan, you know, talked briefly about all those. But um, there's, there's a, um, I think Ryan, you even told me this yesterday, there's going to be a method to the madness that we put through. We share all of these goals with you, but these are goals that your child will set that are, that are discussed between um, the parent, the coach, and the child. We want to make sure that as we uh, as we go through our goal setting, everything's based around um, the, the top six, four, six, eight tournaments that we want to be playing during the year. And then our structure with the practices, which we'll go through in a minute, it works backwards. This is a process. Multiple sports and activities, at least up until their age of 14, 15, maybe even 16, as it's very good for them to be doing all of these activities. So we want them to be well-rounded. We want um, all these goals to be flexible. So as we go through it, they may hit some things or there may be something that comes up an injury or growth spurts, which I'll talk to about here in a second. All of these need to be flexible and adjustable as we go. 
Um, and then, like I said at the end, it's performance goals that we're setting in place, not necessarily outcome goals. So if we know that the, the goals are to focus in on two or three areas of their game, and if those things start to really click, then we know the results or the winning piece of it will take care of itself. So as we think about their training, we, we talk about the most complete tennis athlete. And we know that there are six areas that the players have to go uh, be focused on. So the coaches, that's their responsibility to focus on the strength, power, mobility, movement, conditioning, and the coordination. And as Randy said, there's conditioning that's going to happen on the court, but off the court with our sports partners, nutrition and all of that will be a big part of their training. But if you think about when it comes to their strength, we don't need the players to be big and bulky in tennis. That's if you look at the top players, that's actually just not what we typically see. Um, strength is important because this improves their overall tennis performance but it also helps decrease their risk of injuries, which is why some of these things that will, uh, the videos that hopefully will come through and I'll be able to show them to you, um, I'll, those are gonna be important for your child to be doing now. Um, power, we know that this is gonna be big, especially with in today's game, so being explosive, not only just with um, their, their technical or the tactical aspects, so hitting a serve big is, is, is good, but also being explosive off their first step and be able to move around the court in that manner, power is going to be important. Mobility, we, we know that this, the, like I mentioned before, the core is such a big uh, piece of uh, good tennis players or golfers for that matter, and being able to have good mobility um, it, it's going to dictate the, the capabilities of what they can do on the court, especially when it comes to the power. Obviously, movement is going to be big. Um, some of the uh, things that I'll talk about in the videos I'll show you here in a sec um, is, is geared around that. We need them to be very um, adaptable to being able, able to move in different directions, not just laterally and up and back, but all sorts of different ranges. And we know that the top level players um, have great mobility, great movement, and they're very uh, coordinated. So the conditioning piece, this helps them not only train and perform at the high, highest levels, but it also, again, helps in the recovery phase. And the recovery phase is not only, um, you know, thinking about the end of a tournament or in the end of the matches, but their training sessions, as well as their point play. So uh, tennis is a very physical uh, sport. At, at the end of a 20, 30, 40 second point, um, if they're in good condition, they recover quickly and able to be, and they're able to uh, play the next point at a high level. If their conditioning isn't there, then that, that drags on for two, three, four points, or maybe even games, which we can't afford to in, in a sport like tennis. And then obviously coordination, as we know, that's the foundation for the overall uh, quality of a top level player. We know that the kids need sound fundamental skills. And so Ryan's job is to make sure that not only tactically, but everything from a technical aspect um, is, is solid for them to be able to improve and move from 10s, 12s and move on. Um, and, you know, there are way more uh, kids at the age of 10 and 12 that are really good players that are not good players when they're 16 and 18. There are probably more stories of, of um, parents and kids focusing too much too early on the development of those kids then and, and more the development of their winning. And our goal is to make sure that they have fa sound fundamentals so that when they're 16, 18, 20, 25 and beyond is when they're actually gonna be succeeding. We also wanna make sure they have the most complete game possible. We don't want them to just be able to play from the net or from the baseline or have a great serve. We want to make sure that, you know, because tennis is one of those sports that you have to adapt. Maybe yesterday I played great from the baseline or maybe even the first set I played great from the baseline. Now can I uh, change a little bit and adapt and, and move forward a little bit more because uh, my opponent's causing certain things to happen or what was working for me before isn't happening now. And then competency-based teaching. And, and competency for us is based on, and I'll have a slide here in a second, but based around all of the different aspects from their ground strokes to their volley serves and everything else. And those are, we set parameters to those because it is a process. It's our, your child, our goal is for your child to be peaking and playing their best at the point where we know that they need to be getting into uh, higher level tournaments. But we also know that, you know, our ultimate goal is for them to be getting a, a college education and going on to school and getting a scholarship and maybe even playing in the pros. So 
for them to peak um, now between the ages of 10, 12, and 16 is not ideal. We know that the, the male tennis player now um, peaks around 27 eight years of age, and we know that the women are peaking now somewhere in that 23 to 25 years of age. We also know that there's progressions that will be in place, and you'll look out there and wonder why we're doing certain things or when Ryan shares certain aspects of what we do. It's it's the basis of all learning, right? We learn progressions when we do math or, or science or anything. Tennis is the same thing. So we have um, the progressions that we'll go through. Competencies, as I mentioned before, those are the parameters of sound play. And I'll show you a slide here in a second. Planning and goals, we've, you know, this is a drive, the, the driver for success. They, we have to have those in place and understand what the goals are of the player. And then problem solving, not only in tennis, but this is a huge key life skill for us. And we need to develop that because tennis is one of the only sports, there are a few out there, but um, it's constant problem solving. It's not always about me playing my best tennis, but it's also understanding what tactics uh, hurt my opponent. And when they start to readjust, what do I need to do to kind of keep the, the foot on the pedal? So as we go, there's the developmental plan, the periodization plan, and the practice plan. The, the developmental plan obviously is, is very similar to what we just talked about, but it's establishing, you know, by the player with the coaches and the parents are involved in that, but it can't be the parent or the coach dictating what the goals are for the player. It has to be the player's goals. Now they may not understand what those are and where, what the, you know, what the different avenues will be. So we can share that, but that's got to come from the player itself. And then just like I said, with the periodization plan, that's based on what are the tournaments that we know that we need to be playing? How are we going to scale those back? Um, you know, we're going to play these next, you know, the, the six biggest tournament through the year are coming up. We want to play a tournament, if not two tournaments before each one of those, so that we're getting lots of match play. And then our practice plan is then dictated by that schedule. So all of these three plans work together as we build a schedule of playing for each child. As I talked about before, the growth and developmental keys, these are things that we need to make sure that parents and players especially understand because there's gonna be aspects through the entire year where all of a sudden your, your child was playing and, and doing certain activities that now we have scaled back on or maybe we weren't uh, doing a lot of it, but now all of a sudden we're doing much more of that and the players are wanting to know and, and parents are wanting to know why was that happening? And so there's a lot of factors that go into place and one of them, um, which is huge, is just the physical growth spurt, right? We know that males typically have their growth spurts around the age of 14 and the females around 12. Well, when that's happening, their bodies are changing. Somebody that may have been very athletic and very agile is now trying to grow into their body and we need to adjust their training to um, complement that. So uh, we also see, um, uh, you know, there's, there's the, um, the pain that comes with bones growing and when activities need to be scaled back and when we need to be doing less weights or, or less movement in, in certain aspects. So shin splints is one that we see a lot from the kids as they get older, um, you know, and going through this growth spurt. So when I talk about the competencies, these are, these are the parameters, and, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but just so you have an idea. But we're looking at a lot of things, at least seven of them, right? So forehands, backhands, volleys, serves, returns, movements, tactical, technical, all of this stuff that rolls into the competencies and what the kids need to know, and then the parameters. So when it comes to grips, what are the, you know, we, we don't want the child to only have a semi-Western grip. And some of the videos I'll show you um, are, are fun things that you can do in the you know on a wall or a garage door. But um, one of the things that we know kids are lacking right now is the freedom of experimenting. And so grips, we want the kids to be able to experiment with different grips. Roger Federer being one, if you asked him how many grips do you have on his forehand, he would tell you a variety of different ones. And it depends on the situation and when he's gonna use certain ones. But we give them parameters with all of these, rotations, loading, stances, recoveries. All of this ro uh, rolls into what's happening on the court with Ryan. When it comes to our fitness, 
I mean, there's a lot that we need to be doing both on and off the court. So the foundation, that's your overall conditioning. We need to make sure that the kids are uh, able to be out there. Tennis is very much a runner sport these days. It is very high impact. It is a lot of short sprints. There's no reason for us to have the kids out running several miles um, at one time because tennis just is not it's not built that way. So we've got to build a good, strong foundation and that starts early. And so Ryan's going to be taking time to understand each child over the first few weeks and really build in the foundation piece that we need. The development piece, um, that's obviously making sure that we're building on the foundation so that they can with, they can withstand higher workloads. As, as they get bigger and stronger, we're going to need to task them with doing more. And so we want to make sure that that developmental pathway with the fitness and training is there. And then the world-class performance. We know if we really start to stay on this pathway and progressions, the likelihood of injuries and all of that stuff decreases drastically because we're making sure that off the court, they're really working. Again, it's not heavy lifting. It's all the other, making sure that the small muscles are working as well as the bigger muscles so that it improves their overall performance, their training, and, uh, and their recovery time, which is huge. We do not put enough emphasis on the recovery of the players. So for your child to be playing every single day uh, of the week, is not healthy for them. I know they want to play it probably every day of the week, but we need to scale back and be cognizant of the of the injury factor that really happens and give them their body some time mentally and physically time to recover. There's a lot that we're going to be doing with the kids um, and everything uh, that Ryan is doing. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be doing off court too because we want to make sure that this is this is beneficial not to just the group of players, but the individual child so we're setting up uh you know a plan and a structure uh that's based around your individual child as opposed to the academy itself so when they need to be playing tournaments specifically uh what kind of exercises they need to be doing not as a mass but as an individual which is why we feel that our academy is is uh offers something very very special So some of the things that we can be doing that the kids should be doing, there's ladder work, there's cone work. If you don't have a ladder, just, you know, you can, you can lay down different things. Uh, you know, if you have placemats or if you want to just imagine it, or if you have a little bit of a patio or something where you want to use some chalk, anything where they're working on jogging and skipping and shuffling, we need the coordination to be, um, uh, to be continuing to be working, even though we've got this downtime right now, we're not really able to get on, on the, uh, on the court. Cone work is great. So you can set up cones if you've got them, if you don't, pillows or stuffed animal. I mean, I've seen everything where um, you can set up different patterns with the cones where you're actually working on movement and um, you know, right foot, left hand and all those kind of things where it's rotation based. It can be uh, memory based where you set uh, you know, different, um, uh, you know, maybe we're talking stuffed animals. I was talking to a girl the other day and she was 11 years old and she had stuffed animals out. And so each animal is, you know, uh, laid out in a semicircle and, and you number them or you can name them. You know, there's a, there's a dog, a horse, um, a giraffe and a lion and you set up a pattern. You need to touch the giraffe twice. You need to touch the lion and, and then horse. And so they're not only doing quick movement patterns with it, but it's a memory um, uh, factor as well, which is exactly what we need. If you're able to, if you have tape, maybe tape out a hexagon or an octagon or something where the kids can stand outside of the box at the bottom and they and there's patterns that they play, uh, you know, one, three, five, four, or something where they're jumping to that number and back out each time. So we're working on movements. We do it with two feet, one foot. We can add different spins and stuff. All the kids should be doing jump rope. If they don't have a jump rope, just mimic a jump rope motion, but doing one leg, two legs, alternating, doing rhythms, crossing the feet over, you know, the feet over and back as they do the jumping, um, and then how fast they can do different patterns with it. So the quickness element. And then ball toss. You can have a short little space. This is all done inside. We don't need a ton of room. If you have an area that you can clear out six or eight feet, that's awesome. But ball toss could be, you know, shuffling and tossing and catching. It could be shuffling and tossing it off a wall, a wall that then rebounds back to the kids. 
It could be mom and dad, uh, the, your child is facing the ball, the wall itself, and you toss a ball over their shoulder or to their side and they have to react to it coming off the wall, re ricocheting off. So there's all sorts of different fun things that we should be doing that are gonna help your child. And all of these, if you see, and you've noticed, none of these right now have a racket. Shadow drills are not the shadow drills like with, and you, and you can, right, with doing your strokes itself. So I shadow a forehand or a backhand ground stroke, but shadow drills where you're following somebody. So if Ryan and I are facing each other, I'm the leader and Ryan has to stay with me as if he's my shadow. So if I quickly move to the left or right, Ryan has to mimic that. And I do that for 20 or 30 seconds. And then he does a little bit of that. There's the elevated push-ups where I'm on, a, I'm on a chair with my hands and my feet are on the ground or on the edge of a wall and I do some push-ups and then I want to reverse and put my hands on the ground and my feet up on the chair and I do some push-ups that way. It, it will isolate different areas of your, of your body um, and, um, uh, and allow them to uh, uh, grow and strengthen different areas as we go. So what that you're seeing is that very quick and what the, the little round thing on the top of the cones is a light and it's already programmed for the kids to uh, or the players to move and uh, all they have to do is wave their hand over the light. But what you would do as a play as a parent, you would just call out these numbers so they would still be moving, but you can see the quick actions you want it to be random and you don't want it just to be back and forth so you can see how quickly they move. Um, back and forth on these. And this is something that is uh, super important for the, um, for the kids. So here's another one with the leg, uh, single leg squats. Um, and what we're looking for is the, the kids to do this very slowly because this is, this is very good for the, the um, flexion from this hips, but also the, the, the uh, thigh and all, and all the way down through the ankles. But you want to be careful as the kids do this. But what they do is they bend over, they squat down with one foot, they drop the ball on the ground, they pick it up, and if they if they have a partner or a brother or sister, then they obviously pass it back. Um, if not, they would just continue to do this. Maybe do this three times in a row, and then switch to the other leg. But this is different than your normal squat. We don't do enough of these, um, and this is super super uh, important for the kids. And you can see it's extremely tiring for the kids too. This way that we're going to show you is if there's a coach or a parent that is um, uh, calling out what the, what the kids should do. So either head, shoulder, knees, toes. Uh, and uh, one way is you do, you just alternate saying, you know, head, toes, shoulders, knees, and the kids are supposed to do what you're doing. And then, then you could call out ball. And when you yell out ball, you want them to quickly grab the ball. You can either do it as this as a, as a competition. So the boys are gonna try to compete who can grab the ball first. Then there's patterns and there's memory games that we want them to do. So in this case, and I'm gonna let it run with the, um, with the volume just so you can get an idea. But in this case, they're, they're asking the kids to remember when I say the, the, um, the, in this case, it's going to be shoulder. When I say shoulder twice in a row, that's when you touch the ball or grab the ball. So there's a lot of different cool things that the kids can be doing. Heads, shoulders, heads, knees, heads, shoulders, shoulders. But all of these videos uh, that you see that are coming up, we want to make sure that you're doing them correctly as opposed to doing them really, um, really fast.